<coughs> I've scratched the surface. I've covered about 5% of what, of what you can learn about uh, just about accounts and permissions. But the only way you're going to learn this is to do it. And that's why part of your first task is to work with accounts and permissions and groups. You will, I'm giving you six weeks on this assignment, not because I'm generous. I mean, that would never happen, would it? <laughs> Simply because I want you to fail. I want you to try things out and fail the first time. That, can, that came out wrong, didn't it? <laughs> it's not on camera, is it? It is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brutally edited, be jump cuts. Okay, what I mean is, you will get things wrong the first couple of times you do it. I want you that to happen because the best way to learn is to get it wrong, learn from your mistakes, and then get it wrong again. Learn from those mistakes, reformat your car because you've really got it wrong, and then start again and get it right because that will stick. But I've got to make sure I'm giving you enough time to do go through that process, haven't I? I haven't, I've got to give you enough time to be able to get things wrong and then get things wrong, get things wrong again, and then get things right. <coughs> So that's why I'm giving you six weeks on this, not because you can have two weeks off. Okay, we are going to cover in the next part of the session, just make sure, yeah, we're good. Uh, creating users, installation of MySQL. So we're going to install a database. We're going to create users and databases, and we're going to look at database admin tasks. And your assignment is going to be around this. You're going to port your entire database from Creative with the structures, the schema, and the content across to your Raspberry Pi. I mean, your entire database on the Raspberry Pi. That's the end challenge. Now, you're going to install two packages. Remember apt from the last lab? The advanced package tool. You're going to install MySQL Server. Now, a word of warning, they've just upgraded to 5.5. I've had to change this slide for this, this presentation. Some students are having difficulties, they're having problems with, the, with, with 5.5, and it's, they're having a few issues. I would recommend you install this as soon as possible, because if it goes pear-shaped and you have to reformat your card and start again, I'd rather you got this done before you did anything else. Does that make sense? Before you do any accounts or anything else, get install database and make sure it's working. It's the worst bit of the assignment, getting it working, because it's so new. So 5.5 has only been out a couple of weeks now. <coughs> But if, you, if it's the first thing you do on the card, on the, on, the, on the server, if it goes wrong and you have to reformat again, you haven't wasted time doing everything else. That makes sense. I want to make sure that you're not wasting time on this. If it does go pear-shaped, really, we've had students spend two, three hours in the third year trying to get it to work with, to no avail. Just reformat the card and start again. Yeah. <coughs> as soon as you're in, logged in, install this, make sure it's working before you do anything else. <coughs> yeah, <coughs> you're wasting more time. <coughs> you need MySQL Server to be able to create a database server. If you want to type in MySQL minus you, know you typed into to Creative, you're actually accessing the database client because you're the client connecting to the server. So you need to install both the server and the client on the on your Raspberry Pi. They're not big. I mean, the, the whole MySQL database is 90 meg, <coughs> so you've got plenty of space. When you install it, it will ask you for a root password. Twice. Just like when you're logged into a secure shell, logged into your, your Raspberry Pi, that root password you must keep protected. So make sure you, you don't put something easy in there. If you press enter, it leaves it blank, which is probably the most insane thing you could do. <coughs> so it means anyone can delete your databases. <coughs> now, two important commands. The config file where you change your database configuration is in etc mysql my.cnf <coughs> to restart your server and we'll talk about this um, this special folder a bit later on anything in the init d folder automatically runs when the device starts that's the auto runs anything in that folder so the mysql program is in the init d folder technically it's not it's actually a sim link in there but as far as you're concerned, anything that's in that folder will automatically run when the machine fire, when the machine boots up, when you restart the machine. So to restart the server, you simply call MySQL with restart, and that will restart your server. Nothing else, just the server. It'll say, coming down, OK, going up, OK. If that works, you know everything's fine. 
we've had the problems where you take the server down, you bring it up again, and that's when we get fails. So just check that process, do the restart to make sure everything's fine. If you get past that point, you're probably going to be okay for the rest of the rest of the lab. <coughs> now, here's the MySQL settings. So remember this my.cnf file. This is part of the contents of the my.cnf file. And as you can see at the bottom, it has what's called a bind address. This is the address, the IP address, where you connect to the server, connect to the database. At the moment, it's set to 127001, which is called a loopback address, which I'm sure you covered in 120 loopback addresses, networks. Basically, it means I can only connect to the server, the database server, when I'm logged into the Raspberry Pi. Just like you can only connect to your MySQL server, can't you? On Creative, when you're logged onto Creative. If you want to connect from another, another computer, you change that bind address to the IP address of your Raspberry Pi. Okay, think about it for a minute. You're changing, you're changing that to your Raspberry Pi's IP address, which means if the IP address changes, you've got to go back in to the config file and change that IP address. If you change it to the IP address of the <coughs> server, then you can connect from anywhere. You can use things like MySQL Workbench and all those, all the graphical GUI tools and things. You can connect to your database. <coughs> so we change it to, that's my one at home, 192.168.163. Um, but it's a massive security risk. I know we've got permissions on the system, but if you can prevent, if you, can, if you don't need access from off the server, it's a lot more secure, isn't it? So think about it. You've got to do it as part of your task anyway, but for, your, for, for real life, you may not need to have that facility. <coughs> but once you're in there, you're logged in as root. Every one of you has one database on Creative, which means when we create an account for, for you, we have to create a new database on the Creative server. So it's not like Access, where each Access file is a database. The MySQL server is currently running 500 separate databases one for every single member of the department. <clears throat> so we can create databases. So when I created yours, it was create database CU123567. Remember when we created the, we had the database names with CU in front. And that's because you can't have a database name starting with a number. That's why we put this capital C, capital U in front of it. So to create a database is really easy. Semicolon at the end because you're logged into MySQL, but your root so you can create databases. You've got all permissions. <clears throat> we also need to create users for our database. So in our instance, it was create user CU123567, identified by CU123567. That's what we typed in when we created your accounts on Creative. So you put the username and the password in the same command, and that's an SQL command. Then it gets a bit more complicated after this slide. <clears throat> now, You can create, you can change your password to anything you want. Now, if you're going to connect just or through Creative Server, in other words, you only want to create, you only want to connect to the database when you're logged into the Pi, for instance, you'd put set password for test user at localhost. That restricts the user to only be able to access the database with that password from the Raspberry Pi. And that's effectively what you've got on your system, on the, on the creative server. You can only log into the database once you've logged into Secure Shell, can't you? As a security feature. So if you want those permissions, you put the at localhost at the end, and that binds the login to the local, local device. <coughs> okay, and there's all sorts of things. If you, let's say you've got an IP address of your machine at home, you want to connect through there, you'd say test user at 192.168.1.whatever, whatever, yeah? If you want to have a range of IP addresses, if they all start with 192.168.1, you can say uh, test user at 192.168.1. And then put a percentage sign in. Remember, percentage means is a wildcard, isn't it? In data in SQL. So you can restrict access to black blocks of IP addresses. So in other words, even if someone managed to find and get your password, unless they were on your internal network, they wouldn't be able to log into the database. Okay, so. Privileges. This is the hardest bit to get your head around. There are about 25 privileges you can assign to a user. So what I've done, rather than listing all 25, I've given you a web link, and that will take you to the full detailed list. 
sign-in privileges. This is not access. With MySQL, you can assign lots of different granular privileges to databases, to tables, and even to columns in a database. You can restrict update commands, for example, to certain columns in a database. So very, very uh, tight restrictions. So here we have a classic website permission. You know when you logged in to, to, um, when you did your PHP code and you had to put your username and password in? That was a bad idea because your username and password had lots of extra privileges that the, data, that the uh, PHP script didn't need. What you'd normally do is create one account for the development to build the databases and configure it, and a separate account which you put into your PHP script. Because really, the only things a PHP script is going to be able to do is select, insert, delete, and update. It's very unlikely your PHP script is going to be build, make, creating tables, isn't it? Or dropping tables. So even if someone gets hold of the PHP username and password data, but your database username and password, they're restricted in what they can do. If you're not deleting records using your PHP script, don't give delete privileges. Just leave it off the list. And because you want local access, we'd set web user at localhost. Because the web server's on the same server as the database, so therefore what's the point in having access from outside for the web server? It's on the same, it's on the same computer. So this is the privileges we give you. This is when we set your accounts up on creative, this is what, what I set them to. Grant, create, so grant is permission. Create, okay, which means you can create um, databases. Alter, so you can alter your databases, add columns. Select, insert, delete, update, so there's your CRUD operations. Create view, so you can create special read-only views. Uh, drop, means you can drop tables. And index, which means you can add indexes. You know, five primary keys, foreign keys, and so on. And lock tables, which means you can obviously lock tables. And that's permissions I tend to assign to a web developer who's working on the system. Now, let's go back to the command there. Can you see it says on bookshop.star to test user? That means every table in the bookshop database. Bookshop is the database, star is the table, dot table. So, if we said grant blah 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 to a localhost at book, so to bookshop at dot genres, so instead of um, on bookshop dot star to bookshop dot genres, they've only got those permissions on one table, on the genres table. Okay, so you're restricting what they can do on individual tables. So if the web user is going to be reading um, genres and not changing genres, you can just give them select. Which means even if, the, if someone gets your password, they can only select content from the database table. <coughs> you can even control access to column. Now, grant select, now look at this example. I'm, so I'm granting select permissions on the ISBN, the title, and the author, so they can read those three columns. But generally, you don't want to be able to change the ISBN, do you? Once you create an ISBN on the system, that doesn't change. So I'm giving update only on title and author. So now I'm controlling what privileges, what grants I'm assigning to for on a particular table on a particular column of that table. So it's really watertight. If you lock things down properly, it's, very, it's, it's a very secure system. You can also restrict privilege by IP, which I think I've talked about before. So, took my time, we're doing well. Okay, now, so look at the bottom example. Grant select on bookshop.star to web user at 192.168.1.percentage. In other words, on any device whose IP address starts with 192.168.1. In other words, for most of you at home, that's going to be a machine that's connected to your internal network. So even if someone hacked through your firewall, they still will not be able to access the database. Okay, and when you work with an industry, when they, with database permissions, they'll often ask you before they give you permissions on the database, what's your IP address? And they'll give you a static IP sometimes just to make sure that they've got a very secure connection. So that's something you need to be aware of. Okay, revoke privileges. If I get it all wrong, I can simply revoke all, and that gets rid of all the privileges, and then I can grant again, and grant the correct set of privileges. It's almost impossible to 
grant bits and pieces, revoke bits and pieces. You need to revoke all and then grant the bits you want if you get it wrong. And if you want to see what privileges a user has, show grants. You can see what privileges that user's currently got on your database. Okay, now, this is important. The privileges are loaded from a database table into memory when the database is running, which makes it faster for people to log in and to access stuff. The problem with that is it doesn't bother to go back and look at the privileges table once it's running. So if you change privileges, the chances are it won't see that you see you've made changes. So it's almost like restarting the database. You, you call flush privileges, and that tells it to throw away the stuff in RAM and go back and fetch a fresh copy of the privileges from the privileges table, which means it will load all the new stuff in as well. Often you will forget that. Sometimes it works. If you haven't got much RAM like the Raspberry Pis, it has to keep going back anyway. So you might hit lucky. It might have gone back just at the right moment to check the privileges. But on a big system where you've got gigs and gigs of RAM, it might be months before it goes back and checks those privileges tables. So flush privileges, I always run that after I've done any changes. And of course, when you're logged onto your Raspberry Pi, it's just like connecting to your uh, MySQL database on Creative, isn't it? My, it's MySQL, put the username in, password, database if you've got a database, and you can test it. Now, this is one of the tasks, and this is a bit trickier, and that's why I put it in for you. There's a fantastic free tool for MySQL called MySQL Workbench. And in theory, you should be able to install that software on your laptop, on your computer at home, and if you set the privileges properly on your database, you should, in theory, be able to connect from your desktop graphical tool straight to the database and use the graphical tools to manipulate import-export data, create tables using the MySQL Workbench tool. So have a think about it and see if you can get that working. Really, it's really, uh, really good. And there it is, look. So MySQL Workbench, create a new connection, and you can simply add your IP address your username, your password for your database, and if your privileges are set properly, it will let you connect. You click on test connection, yep, and it's all correct. And now I can connect, I can access the database on the server, and I can work with it. Yeah, and it saves its little, uh, little connection. And to connect again, I just double click, and it opens up the connection. It's almost like working with access, but with a proper server side database. Okay, database admin. We're doing right. Okay, right. The data is stored in var lib MySQL. Every database is a folder. Every table is a file inside that folder. So it's very simple structure. Um, right. This is uh, this is quite useful. A few commands just to have a play with. Uh, select user comma host from MySQL user. It tells you the username and where they're connecting from. Then we had problems earlier in the year with uh, with the creative server. This is, what, this is how I started to debug what was going on. I had too many concurrent connections. Show process list. This is really cool. Look, there's a process list. And can you see, uh, I've got sleeping connections, a query taking place from root, because that's what I've just done. And you can see all the people connecting and the timeouts and how long they've been connected for. Timeout is important. If the database can only support a certain number of concurrent connections. If you let people hang on to idle connections for too long, you run out of connections for people to connect to. So we're going to change the default timeout to reduce how long the connection stays open for, and we're going to change the number of concurrent connections. So here's an example. Maximum 100 connections. Maximum timeout is 999 seconds. Okay, just a number I made up. And the interactive timeout, if someone's actually interacting with it, and let's say a query goes wrong, you know sometimes things hang. It's saying after 80,000 seconds, the chances are it's probably dead. So disconnect them. Okay, so maximum connections is 100 people, 100 connections at once. No connection can last for more than 999 seconds. Idle, then it gets disconnected. And if something goes wrong, no, wait, no longer than 80,000 seconds. After 80,000 seconds, automatically, even if the query is not finished, disconnect them because the chances are it's crashed and you can tweak those settings to your heart's content. Okay, this is quite cool, backing up data. Select SAR from my table into out file, 
fields terminated by this generates a CSV file for you. You can take a whole database table and dump the contents of the CSV file to your file system. Could be useful for one of the tasks, bit of a hint there. Now, the second lab, create user accounts and sudo, install configure MySQL and tweak the config file, create databases with a couple of users, it's all on the lab sheet, so you should know what you're doing anyway, back up your creative database and import it into the, onto the Raspberry Pi, and then have a go at connecting from an external host. Yes, my external host is MySQL Workbench, basically. And it could be the, um, it could be, um, the terminal. No, you're on Windows, aren't you? No, it's MySQL Workbench. Okay, so that's what they like you to do. Um, don't worry about the second bit. Ignore that. That's, that's no longer relevant. I've put lots of references, by the way. If you get stuck, at the end of every presentation, I've got a slide of uh, useful links for you to help you out.